Take a couple of good long deep in and out breaths. Notice where you feel the breathing process in the body. When we talk about breath, it's not just the air coming in and out of the lungs, it's the movement of energy that goes along with that. That actually brings the air in and allows it out. And that can be felt anywhere in the body. And there are many layers of energy as well. So focus on what you can see most clearly. Focus on a spot that seems most congenial. And then notice if the breath is comfortable. If your breathing feels labored, think of the breath coming in and out through all the pores of the skin. You can experiment with different rhythms and textures of breathing. Long in, long out, short in, short out, long in, short out, short in, long out, deep, shallow, heavy, light, broad or narrow. See what breathing feels best for the body right now. We're trying to bring the mind into a state of concentration with as much mindfulness and alertness as possible. And the mind finds it easier to stay concentrated when it's with something that's pleasant. So instead of sending your awareness outside, you can allow your awareness to fill the whole body. Think of the breath filling the whole body as well. After all, there is a movement of energy that goes through the nerves as you breathe. And if you're sensitive to that, you can think of that spreading around, everything connecting in the body. Even though there may be pains in the body, you can breathe right through them. Think of the breath energy going through, say if there's a pain in the knee or a pain in the stomach. Think of the energy going right through there. After all, the energy is actually there before the pain. Breath is your first layer of awareness with regard to the body. It's what allows you to know that you have a body here. And then through the breath, then you are aware of other aspects of having a body, like the solidity, the coolness, the warmth, pains, pleasures in the body. These all are known through the breath. So if there's some part that's not feeling pleasant, feeling painful, well, think of the breath being there first, and allow the breath in that area to have the sense that it's flowing smoothly. Now we're meditating not to get the breath, we're meditating to get the mind. But you'll learn a lot about the mind as you deal with the breath, because it is so near the breath. It's like a mirror right up next against your face. You see clearly all the little details. So once the rhythm of breathing feels good, you can think of spreading your awareness around to different parts of the body and notice how the breathing part process feels, say in the stomach, in the chest, in the head, in the back, in the arms, the legs. If there's tension anywhere in the body, allow it to relax. Because what you want is a state in which a feeling of well-being suffuses the body. Again, even though there may be pains in the body, think of that well-being surrounding the pains, cutting off connections between pains, and also having your awareness fill the body as well. Because the whole purpose of concentration is first to get a sense of well-being and this state of all-around awareness. Because you want to see the mind from all around, so make the body the whole body your mirror for looking at the mind. So when something comes up in the body and the mind has a response or a reaction, you'll notice. Or if something comes up in the mind and it has an impact on the body, you want to be able to notice that as well. And this can happen anywhere in the body. That's when the mind is solidly here with a sense of well-being that it can watch things a lot more objectively. Pains come up and you don't have to feel threatened by them. 
emotions come up that you find troubling, but you don't have to feel threatened by them either. You have to note that they're there. And for the time being, you don't want to give them your awareness or your attention. You want to give your attention to the breath. You're trying to establish a good, solid foundation for observing events in the body, events in the mind, and particularly events in the mind. All too often we have a tendency to think that we're simply on the receiving end of things coming in from outside. But the Buddhist picture of the mind is a lot more active. Your mind plays a role in fabricating your sense of the world, your sense of yourself. And you want to be able to see that clearly, because it's because we fabricate these things in ignorance that we suffer. For instance, with pain. There's a fact of physical pain, which in and of itself is not, not that much of a burden on the mind. The real burden is all the stuff you do around it. The Buddha uses the word sankara, translated as fabrication. And I was mentioning it earlier this morning. Another way you could translate it is simply jerry-rigging. We try to put together a way of dealing with the world based on what comes to hand, what ideas, what notions, what images in the mind. And if something seems to work, then it becomes part of our repertoire for dealing with the world. But our idea of working in our standards for what work works can often be pretty sloppy, and then we find that a lot of our tools can turn on us if we don't use them well. These tools come in three types. There's bodily fabrication, which is the way you breathe, verbal fabrication, which is the way you talk to yourself about things, and then there's mental fabrication, perceptions, which can either be individual words, the labels you put on things, or images that appear in the mind. You see somebody unfriendly and you think, monster, or your lizard brain is telling you something that is dangerous. And little images can flicker through the mind and have an impact on how you see that person. And then their feelings, feeling tones of pleasure or pain, neither pleasure nor pain. Those are also mental fabrications. And these are the things that make us suffer if we do them in ignorance. So what we're trying to do as we meditate is learn how to do them with knowledge. Look in a state of concentration. You've got the breath. That's bodily fabrication. You learn how to breathe in a way that's soothing, energizing when the body's tired, soothing when it's feeling pained, relaxing when it's feeling tense. In other words, you don't let the breath just do whatever it's going to do willy-nilly. You try to have some sense of how to use the breath to be on your side. Then there's verbal fabrication. You're talking to yourself about the breath, focusing your attention on the breath and commenting on it, asking questions about it. Is long breathing good or is shorter breathing? Deep, shallow. Once you found a breath that's good, how do you maintain it? And then when you maintain it, what do you do with it? These are questions you ask yourself, and they're a legitimate part of the concentration. As we chanted just now, in the first jhana, there's directed thought and evaluation. That's what this internal chatter is. Now you get to the higher levels of concentration, you can drop that. But to get the mind to settle down, you need to do some adjusting. So you're learning to use ver verbal fabrication in a way that's skillful to help the mind settle down. Similarly with mental fabrication, you hold in mind the perception that breath is not just air coming in and out of the lungs, but it's an energy that suffuses the body. And that's prior to other things in the body. You hold that perception in mind. It makes it a lot easier to breathe and to develop a sense of whole body awareness with the breath. And through the combination of all these things, you can give rise to a sense of well-being. So you're using these three kinds of fabrication to create a state of concentration, a state of well-being. And as you get hands-on experience with them, then you begin to notice other ways in life in which you're using these fabrications, and not in not such a skillful way. And you can change. For instance, when there's pain in the body, 
we have a tendency to try to enclose it in a shell to make sure it doesn't spread. But that shell then imprisons us, and it creates barriers for the breath. And you find that the breathing process gets a lot more restricted. So you use your knowledge of how to deal with the breath, how to ease tension, breathe through things, to help alleviate some of the pain. And then you look at how you're talking to yourself about the pain. One of the first things the Buddha has you do when you're, when you're sick or in pain is to spread lots of goodwill. There's a story in the canon. He was wounded by a stone sliver that penetrated his foot. Devadatta had tried to kill him, rolled him rock down the mountain, and a splinter or a sliver of rock. When the rock crashed against another rock, and a little sliver came out, pierced the boot in the foot. He was in a lot of pain. He lies down. Mara comes to taunt him. And the Buddha says, I'm lying here with sympathy for all beings. And holding the perception of all beings in the mind. Thinking about that helps put you in the right frame of, frame of mind. Because you remember, what are all beings doing? All beings are suffering, but you don't want them to suffer. You're not the only one who's suffering. That's an important thing to keep in mind. We're all subject to aging, illness, and death. And you don't want to carry any ill will into your illness. And then you look directly at how you're talking to yourself about the pain. And a lot of this is pretty subliminal. It helps to get the mind in a good state of concentration where you can be aware of things, but still. So you begin to see what you're saying to yourself about the pain. And a good way to find that out is to ask questions. Is the pain solid? Or does it come in moments? And is the pain the same thing as the part of the body it's in, or is it there but on another level, like another frequency? Like the difference between the different radio waves penetrating the room right here, right now. This radio stations, Tijuana, San Diego, Los Angeles, Riverside, they're all penetrating here in the same spot. But if you use a radio and you're tuned to different frequencies, you get a distinct frequency, a distinct radio station. It's the same with the pain in the body. The body is one level of frequency, you might say. It's characterized by the what are called the four properties of earth, water, wind, and fire, solidity, liquidity or coolness, the energy of the breath, warmth. And the pain is something else. Can you see that? Ask yourself that question. When there are moments of pain, or you can see the pain as having moments rather than being a solid or having a particular shape. When these moments come, do they come at you or do they go away from you? A good perception of older mind, this is where you move into mental, mental fabrication, is the pains are going away. You, as soon as you notice those moments, they're gone. You notice them, they're gone, and they're not coming at you. It's like sitting in the back of one of those old station wagons with a seat faced in the back, toward the back. As soon as anything came into your range of sight, it was going away from you. So what you're learning to do is question, using verbal fabrication, your perceptions, which are mental fabrications, and trying to replace them with better ones, ones that don't inflict the pain on the mind. And start questioning the sense of, is this pain actually invading your space? Is this a space you want to clay claim to anyhow? Can your awareness be one thing and the pain be something else? So what you're trying to get is a state not where you're blanked out, oblivious to everything, because you're not going to understand anything when you're oblivious. The concentration is meant to put you in a state where you're fully alert, but you gain a sense of the awareness being one thing and things that it's aware of are other things. 
and you don't have to lay claim to the things that it's aware of. It can this include thoughts going through the mind, any kind of fabrication. And when you can separate yourself from these things, then there's a lot less burden on the mind. Then you find the pain itself is not a burden. It's because you've created a bridge to the pain through your perceptions, through all the ways you fabricate around the pain, physically, verbally, mentally. And you can learn how to step back from those processes and drop them when you find that they're causing suffering. It's in this way that concentration gives you a good basis for observing the pain, observing the processes by which the mind goes out and creates trouble around the pain. But also the process of creating a state of concentration gives you hands-on experience with how you can take those various processes, those various fabrications, and direct them in a better direction, use them for a better purpose, with more skill. Because you want to learn that given the fact that the mind is here with the body, that's subject to aging, illness, and death, but the mind does not have to suffer from that if it's skillful. If it's not skillful, it lays claim to things and it fabricates things in ways that just pile more and more suffering on. And the sad thing is a lot of us think that that's inevitable, that's just the way things have to be. But it's not. That's what you can call the good news of the Buddha's awakening. There can be pain in the world, but the mind doesn't have to suffer from it. You look at the Four Noble Truths, it's not that pains cause suffering, it's craving and clinging cause suffering. In other words, there are things coming out of the mind that are causing suffering. But they're not things that are there inevitably. If you bring knowledge to them, if you bring awareness to them, you can actually turn them into the path to the end of suffering. That puts a lot of power in your hands. It means that you don't have to be the slave of your pains. You don't have to be driven by your pains. You can approach them with more confidence. As the Buddha said, you want to learn how to comprehend the way the mind creates suffering. Do you understand it to the point where you can stop? So even though the Buddha's teachings focus on pain, he's not pessimistic about the world. He's very optimistic. We can live with aging, illness, and death, but not suffer. And the skill lies in training the mind.